We've now shown that if we have a function over multiple variables, like a utility function with two goods, then we can talk about multiple partial derivatives. So in this case, we could talk about the partial derivative of u with respect to x1 and the partial derivative of u with respect to x2. And if this was a function over more goods, over three goods, for example, we'd also have a partial derivative of u with respect to x3. Or if it was over four goods, we'd have a partial derivative of u with respect to x4, and so on. Now I want to introduce one final idea, and that's the idea of a total derivative. So we're going to write a total derivative for a function like this as du. And what we mean by that is the change in u, the change in that vertical dimension. So if we have x2, x1 here, x2 here, and u, the utility level here, we want to know what's the change in u when there's a change in both x1 and x2. So when there's a change in x1, which we denote as dx1, and a change in x2, which we denote as dx2. And the formula for what the change in utility from such a set of changes is, is pretty simple. It simply says that the change in u will be equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to x1 times how big the change in x1 is, plus the partial derivative of u with respect to x2 times how big the change in x2 is. And that should make a certain amount of intuitive sense. If you want to figure out how much u changed, we got to figure out how quickly u changes when we change x1 and how much x1 changed and how quickly u changes when we change x2 and how much x2 changes. So without formally deriving why this formula looks that way, we can already see it intuitively. So now I want to apply that to the case of a marginal rate of substitution. So you already know what a marginal rate of substitution is. It's the slope of an indifference curve. So if we have an indifference curve, we said at any point that indifference curve has a slope, a line that's tangent to it, and the slope of that line is called the marginal rate of substitution. So what is that marginal rate of substitution? Since it's a slope, it's equal to a change in x2 divided by a change in x1. In other words, a rise over a run. That's just the definition of a slope. A change in x2 over a change in x1. But it's not just any change in x2 over x1. It's a change in x2 over a change in x1 such that we end up back on the same indifference curve, such that the change in utility is equal to zero. Right, so along that slope for small changes, as we go down and over and end up on that line, we're roughly back to the indifference curve so that the utility hasn't changed. Now that's not true for large changes in x2 and x1, but for small changes, that's true. So here we have a total derivative, a total derivative du that's equal to zero for the change in x2 over the change in x1. That's the marginal rate of substitution. Well, we already know what du is. It's this. So by taking this and setting it equal to zero, we can find what change in x2 over change in x1 actually produces a du that's equal to zero. So let's then rewrite this, the partial of u with respect to x1 times dx1 plus the partial of u with respect to x2 times dx2. That's just du. That has to be equal to zero for the changes to be such that we have a marginal rate of substitution. And once we see this, we can just now solve for dx2 over dx1 to figure out what the formula for the marginal rate of substitution is. So we'd want to get rid of this term 
over here because we want just the dx2 on this side. So we can subtract this from both sides and that'll give us the partial of u with respect to x2 times dx2, this term that we've left alone, is equal to minus, since we're subtracting this from both sides, the partial of u with respect to x1 dx1. So we're halfway there. But what we want on this side is dx2 over dx1. Well, we can get dx2 over dx1 if we divide both sides by dx1. So if we divide it both sides by dx1, this is going to disappear and it's going to appear in the denominator here. And we can get rid of this partial of u with respect to x2 by dividing both sides by this. So it'll disappear here and it'll appear in the denominator here. So that's going to be equal to minus the partial of u with respect to x1. That's this term. The dx1 has gone away because that's already appeared over here. And now we're dividing by the partial of u with respect to x2. And so now we have dx2 over dx1, the marginal rate of substitution, because we've derived it from the expression where du is equal to zero. So that's equal to the marginal rate of substitution. What that means is that we can now take a utility function. So suppose we take the utility function that we've been graphing x1 to the 1 half, x2 to the 1 half. We can take that utility function if we just take the partial derivative with respect to x1 and divide it by the partial derivative with respect to x2, we'll have the formula for the marginal rate of substitution for all the indifference curves that emerge from that utility function. So I can already see that when we take those partial derivatives, they're going to get a little bit messy because uh, we have one-halves in the exponents, and so we'll have to subtract ones, and that'll give us negative one-halves and so forth. We can do it, but we also can use a trick because we've already seen that if we square this function, the shapes of the indifference curves don't change, so the marginal rates of substitution shouldn't change. So I'm going to go ahead and square this just to make taking partial derivatives a little bit easier, and when we do that, we get x1 to the 1 half squared is just equal to x1. x2 to the 1 half squared is just equal to x2. So I'll just use that utility function since it gives rise to the same indifference curves and we're trying to figure out the slopes of those indifference curves. So now I can simply apply this formula and say, well, the marginal rate of substitution is going to be equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to x1. So we have to, to take the partial derivative of this with respect to x1. When we do that, we have to leave the x2 alone. So I'll just put that x2 up first. And then we just take the derivative with respect to x1. Well, what's that? If we take the one exponent up front, that'll just give us a one. And then if we subtract one from the exponent, that'll give us an exponent of zero x1 to the 0 is just equal to 1, so just a 1 appears up front. So the partial derivative of u with respect to x1 is just x2, and we can't forget then the minus sign that's over here. Then we have to do the same thing on the bottom, the partial of u with respect to x2. When we take the partial derivative of this with respect to x2, we leave the one x1 alone. So x1, we're going to leave this one alone and just take the derivative with respect to x2, but again, that's going to be a simple derivative. We take the exponent, move it up front, that's just a 1, and then we subtract the 1 from the exponent, that gives us a 0, anything to the 0 power is just 1, so all we have is a 1 up front. So now we have the marginal rate of substitution as being equal to minus x2 over x1. And we can ask, does that make sense for a marginal rate of substitution? We already know that an indifference curve is going to be steeper to the left and shallower to the right. So if we have a lot of x2 and a little bit of x1, we should have a steep 
slope, in other words, a big number in absolute value. Well, if we make x2 big and x1 small, we divide a big number by a small number, and that gives us a big number. So we get exactly what we would expect to get, a steep slope when there's a lot of x2 and very little x1. And similarly, if there's a lot of x1 and very little x2, we divide by a small number, we divide a small number by a large number, and that gives us a small number, a shallow slope. So this formula tells us what the slope of the indifference curve is for any combination of x1 and x2. In other words, for any bundle that I pick, if I pick this bundle, that formula tells me what the slope here is. If I pick this bundle, it tells me what the slope of the indifference curve that goes through that point is at that point, and so forth.